What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down, a crime history podcast presented by Barstow Sports. We're here live in Manhattan, deep in the dungeon, in the belly of the beast. We got an absolutely incredible guest today. I've been trying to get this guy on forever. Uh, we could say he's illustrious. In fact, he is illustrious. How can I not say that? Uh, the former underboss of the Gambino crime family. Uh, he's an author. He's a YouTube sensation and star. It's Sammy the Bull Gravano live here on the sit down presented by Barcel Sports. Sammy, how are you? Good to see you. How are you? How you doing, guys? This good to see you as always. Uh, you're looking uh, you're looking good, Sammy. I gotta say, you're looking dapper. I, I know you said before the show, no more puck and pleasantries, but I gotta say you look pretty good. Good to see you in the flesh finally. I feel good. I feel good. For my age, I'm in pretty good shape. How old are you now, Sammy? You don't ask a woman how heavy she is, and you don't ask an old man how old he is. Right, but fuck it, I'll tell you, 77. 77. Well, I wouldn't have guessed over 65, so you look great. Uh, oh. So, Sammy, uh, you're killing it on YouTube. We'll get to that a little bit later. But this is your first time here. Obviously, I know you've done interviews. We spoke to many people. Uh, on this show, you know, we talk about everybody. We don't just talk about the big names, but you are a big name. You had a wild career. Uh, you were involved with one of the most – publicized people of all time in crime. Uh, but I want to start at the beginning. I'm always curious about people when we speak to them, you know, your childhood, you know, what were your dreams when you were a kid? I know you're from Brooklyn, your mother and father, particular father, they weren't associated with the life. We've heard about so many people where, you know, their father or uncle was in the mob. Your family wasn't. What was your father like, Sam? What kind of guy was he? Good guy. Came from Italy. I mean, um, uh... Spoke with uh, broken broken English, uh, hardworking man, and uh, my mother was a seamstress. My father originally was a painter, and then he got this lead poisoning. There was lead in paints, and he had to stop painting. And he went and they opened up a small little dress factory in uh, Brooklyn. They worked for a manufacturer in uh, uh, in Manhattan. He loved the way my mother was able to uh, make gowns and stuff, and. He told them to open up a factory and he would give them work. And he did. And it was, uh, you know, they worked, you know, to hard work. I had two uh, sisters. I actually had a brother and a sister before I was born. Both of them had died. Years ago, he used to die from uh, pneumonia and stuff like that. I mean, they didn't have the medical. Right. So they died before I was born. But I had two sisters who, you know, so it was like having three mothers. They were older than me. One was nine years older than me. And one was five years older than me. So what it was kind like of, having three moms. What kind of things did your father tell you about those people? Because you know, obviously you're from, you're from Brooklyn. You know, he's Italian. He comes from Sicily. What does he tell you about those people? Is he, you know, does he kind of say, "Yeah, stay away from that stuff. You shouldn't be involved." But I've read also that he was, you know, he knew people. Everybody knew people. Did he tell you about those people though when you were a kid? Well, he used to, every Sunday, he, we would uh, walk down the block and go to church on Sundays and stuff. And as a kid, I asked them who these guys were. They used to hang out outside the bar, shooting crap, police car parked right there. Nobody was bothered. Everybody was well-dressed, diamond pinky rings. And I asked them, who are those guys? And he said, they're bad guys. Stay away from them. He said, uh, don't ever talk about them. Don't ever cooperate or, you know, if anybody asks you questions about them. He said, but they're our bad guys. And uh, that opened up my mind to uh, our bad guys. And uh, there were street guys. Some guys were made guys. Some guys were associates. And uh, I grew to learn about that later on in life. From that day on, though, you probably want did you you wanted to be like them you don't want to be a heart you know you didn't want to work work blue collar right what, what were your dreams did you ever want to be anything else and i always want to ask people that what, what did you want to be when you were younger what, what were your dreams like well i really we, we didn't want to be as when i was young i was dyslexic and i didn't do well in school mm -hmm. and i was out of the entire system in the eighth grade i never got out of the eighth grade and uh so uh and i joined the gang the rampers 
and I think you might be familiar with some of the people who were in the rampers. And uh, yes, I am. Why well, did that? And, but it was us. We would say, you know, it's us against the world. We don't care about nobody, the government, the mafia. We knew they were dangerous, so we didn't fuck with them. We stayed away from them a little bit. But uh, it was us against them. I had no intentions of wanting to be in the mafia. I really didn't. But that 19 years old, I got drafted. I went into the military during the Vietnam War, and I trained and for a couple of years. A couple of years later, I got out of the service at 21. And uh, things had changed with the rampers. I went right back to them, but they were all now who was hooked up with the Genovese family, the Colombo, the Gambino, everybody hooked up while I was gone. When you were when you were with them when you were a kid and even when you came back after after doing military service, what kind of things were you doing? You know, the typical, you know, farm team kind of things or what, what, what were you doing to earn back then? Yeah, bur burglaries, uh, loan shocking, burglaries, um, uh, stuff like that, armed robberies. I did some armed robberies, car theft. Things like that, uh, you know, we did that kind of stuff, and uh, but not nothing really serious, uh, fights, stuff like that, and uh, no murders or anything like that. We would just duke it out in the street, one gang again. You know, that's a nice. There was Puerto Rican gangs, black gangs, you know, Italian gangs, Irish gangs, and you always seem to be fighting with somebody, uh, but uh, nothing real serious. I mean. Tom um, Robbery, I guess he's serious, but uh, I never heard, we never heard anybody. Just in fights, we did a little bit. Even then, when you had a fight, when you won, you stopped. You, you never went overboard to just stomp the guy or beat him to try to beat him to death. You just, he won, you won, he won. Whoever won, it seemed to be over. So it was a little bit different back then. And as you, and as you know, I mean, in the 60s, a lot of people were, were, you know, when you were from Brooklyn, you, you, you kind of aligned with the group. You know, we've we've heard other gangsters. Persico did that. A lot of guys were, were lining up with gangs. But a lot of our, our more advanced people that listen to the show know this, but a lot of people don't know that you initially were involved with the Colombo crime family, obviously where you lived. A lot of Colombo people in that area you know, to this day. Uh, there are Colombo right. people there. What um what kind of things did you initially do? And I know in 1970, you've you've talked pretty openly about the first murder you committed. You know, an individual, Joe Colucci. I kind of want to ask you about that night, the feeling you had. Um, tell us about kind of your early days connected to the Columbos. Well, a friend of mine, Tommy Spiro, his uncle was Shorty Spiro, and uh, he was with the uh, Carmine Persico group. Um, they, these were the guys who were in the war, uh, the Gallo War, the Gallows, and all of these guys were fighting against Profaci. And um, so his uncle wanted to talk to me. He talked to me and he said, Sammy, you're a pretty tough kid. You got a good history, background. You get arrested. You don't talk. You took beatings. You, you know, you gave beatings, he says. But uh, you're a little too tough. You're going to hit the wrong guy one day. You're not hooked up and you're going to get killed. He said, if you hook up with us, you'll be with our family. You'll be part of our family. And uh, those words were magic to me. Then he said, I'll never betray you. You may be asked to do things. I've done them already. I, I might be right by you when we do them. I knew what he was talking about. I knew the history of the mafia a little bit. And uh, I felt that I, sooner or later I got to hook up and I thought this was the right guy. I, he said everything right as far as I was concerned. And I hooked up with him. I wasn't hooked up all that long before there was a conspiracy by Joe Colucci. His wife was cheating on him with Shorty's nephew. And he called one of the guys, Frankie, in, and he says, Frankie, I need your help. Frankie says, what do you want me to do? He says, I'm going to kill Shorty and I'm going to kill Sammy. So we all knew about the affair. So Frankie told him, why would you want to kill Sammy? He's not going with your wife. It's, it's Tommy. You know that. It's not him. What has he got to do with it? He said it was a plot to kill me and Shorty, cause confusion. Six months down the road, he would kill Tommy Spiro. But Frankie didn't buy it. He went to Shorty, reported he was with Shorty as well. And he told Shorty the story. 
it went to Carmine Persico and it went right up to Joe Colombo was the boss at that particular time. And an order came down to take Joe Colucci out. I was called in. I was told about the plot. And uh, I was told to do it. And uh, he asked me, who, who do you need to help you? And I was being honest with him. I says, your nephew. Because he created this whole fucking thing. And Frankie. Because I wanted, I thought maybe they were bullshitting me that this guy wanted to kill me to, to get me angry or something. So I wanted to be able to have him there and question him. And I did. Before we went, I said, Frankie, why didn't you tell me? He said, Sam, I did what I'm supposed to do. I went to the boss. I saved your life. When he came, I didn't help him. I went and, and, and told the truth. And he was right. So I accepted that. And then... Uh, we eventually worked on uh, where and when we were going to kill Joe Colucci. I was going to be the shooter. You know, we, we stopped by a place and called it Famous Cafeteria on 86th Street one night after going after our clubs. And um, when he went to the bathroom, I planned, when we get back to the car, Tommy, you drive. I'll get in the back. Frankie, you get in the back. And Joe Colucci will sit in the front. And when we pull out, we'll go down a block. I'll kill him. And basically, that's exactly what we did. While we were going down the block, I guess Tommy was nervous. He had the radio blasting. The windows were closed. Um, I pulled out a gun, 38. I shot him in the back of the head. Nothing happened. He just, it was like I was shooting blanks. Nothing happened. I shot him again, and uh, he slid to the side. And I told Tommy, lower that fucking radio, open the windows, and smelt the smoke. The noise was deafening inside the car with the windows closed, the music blasting, it was crazy. And I told him to drive to an area outside of Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and um, it was more well, well-to-do neighborhood with beautiful homes and lawns and quiet. And uh, we went there and I told him to pull over. I got out of the car. I opened the door. Tommy was afraid to open the door. He got nervous and he was afraid to touch him. He was afraid to open the door. I got out of the car and uh, I put one arm under his neck and one arm under his legs. I picked him up. I threw him on the lawn in front of a house. I got back in the car. I opened the window and I shot him three more times. And uh, I told him, go back to the neighborhood. Nice and slow, don't go through lights, don't do nothing. And that was my first hit. I, I guess, uh, you know, you're the only one in your own head. What, what are you feeling during that? You're obviously, were you scared at all? Did you have any sort of premonition i don't want to do this i always wonder what you feel like this when you do your first one well, yeah, you it's, it's, it's a good question and i'll tell you how i felt i'm going to be totally honest and it's probably going to sound a little crazy but i watched movies and in a movie when a guy was going to do something like this he was sweating and he was nervous and i was waiting for that to happen when i got back home to where we were living a bunch of us were living together i wasn't living in my house and uh, I got undressed and I took a warm shower, put my hands against the wall, the water running down my head, my body. And I was waiting for that to happen. I thought that's what, what happened. But nothing happened. Never happened. Wow. No, it didn't happen to me. And uh, then I dried up and I went in bed and I slept like a baby. Wow. The next morning I woke up. And there were some of the young girls who were staying there that were coming in the apartment. Oh, my God, Joe Colucci was found in Canarsie, and he was shot. And I remember asking one of the girls, do they know who did it? And she says, it's in the papers, but uh, I don't, you know, there's no names or anything, but he's dead. And I remember they were going back to the corner, and I went, and when I went there, I was standing on the side, and I, I really felt 
this is going to sound strange, an out-of-body experience that I was way, way above everybody and looking at them, and I felt nothing. And they were all talking, and, and then finally my thought and everything was broken when Tommy said, Sammy, my uncle's going to come in and pick us up. Come, my Pesico wants to see us. And I came back to reality. And I went down there. Carmine Persico hugged me, gave me a kiss, told me exactly what happened. And he said, you did a good job. And I got a pat on the back for it. And uh, and I, I I left. And we went to the funeral. I went to the funeral as well. And uh, I thought, and I thought to myself, I had no emotions whatsoever. And I thought that uh, it was strange. And I thought, what am I? Am I, am I just a, a stone cold killer? I don't have any feelings. I don't have anything. It confused the shit out of me, to tell you the truth. I was young. But, uh, and then I went on to become a pretty well-known mafia hit guy. Well, you obviously taught us about the Spiro story. Ultimately, that would, you know, kind of get you moved on. You'd go to the, another family. Can you kind of walk through, that was the situation, basically, that made you kind of leave the Colombo family? Consider, you considered at one point, from what I understand, you know, leaving that life. Is that true? You considered maybe going and doing something else? Because I know you were between... No, your, not with them. Like not after, at that. After the Colombos. It, it way after the Colombos. You know, after that was done, there was the war with the Gallows and Profaci and Joe Colombo took over. Right. The first part of that war, all of them guys went to prison for different bets. Larry Gallo, Joe, Crazy Joe Gallo, they all went to prison. The war stopped. When Crazy Joe Gallo was coming out, the war started again. Mm -hmm. This was right after I was with them for a while. Early shooting, 70s? Yes. Yeah. No, it was actually in the 60s, mm. the late 60s. late 60s. And Shorty called me one day and said, Sammy, go home and get some clothes. We're going to hit the mattresses. This Joe Gallo is coming out of prison, and the war is starting up again. We're going to hit the mattresses. And that was, there wasn't a, ma a million mafia movies like there is now. So I said, what does that mean? He said, if you got a girlfriend, get rid of her. If you got a job, quit. Get your clothes. You're going to live with us. You're going to eat, sleep, and shit together. And I said, why? He said, because the gallows are going to try and kill us. They're a pack of wolves. We're a pack of wolves, and we're going to try and kill them. We have to stay together. And I'm telling you why. You got a girlfriend, you're going to go meet her. They're watching us. They'll see you go into this girl's house every once in a while. One time you're going to go there and you're going to get laid. When you come out, you're going to find two or three guys, four guys waiting for you and they're going to kill you. And that's what we're going to do with them. So you're not going to leave anymore. I says, I got a couple of guys who owe me money. You're not going to do that either. Forget about, don't talk about money. You're not going to need money, food, nothing. You're going to eat, sleep, and shit 24 hours a day, seven days a week with us. No family, nothing. We're your family. This is where you're staying. So that, again, it was like we, we grew. I already did work, meaning a hit. And now I was about to do more work. Um. I was actually brought out because the gallows didn't know me. I was young. They had a spot where he was living in a fancy hotel in Manhattan. He was going out with actresses and stuff like that. And they wanted me to dress up. My hair was long. It was the Beatles days. My hair was long. Uh, they said, keep it long, mess it up, wear a psychedelic T-shirt, ripped jeans, make you like a stone stand in front of this hotel. And when you see him, he had a mole on his face, big mole. Yep. Um, when he gets out of the car, probably get out with an actress. 
they had information what he was doing. Just go up to him and shoot him in the head. There'd be a dog guy there. If he interferes, shoot him too. Try not to shoot the woman. And uh, so I did that. And uh, sure enough, he pulled up in the car. He got out with a beautiful, beautiful woman, mink, white mink coat. It was cold, a long trench coat. And uh, I recognized him. The door guy tried to chase me a few times. I may believe I was stoned and dribbling out of my mouth. And he didn't pay me no mind. He didn't pay me no mind either. But as soon as I was nervous as a bastard, I really didn't want to hurt her or the door man. Um, did that surprise you? Because obviously you, when you did the hit before, you, you didn't have any emotion. Was it just because of all the you know, people that were around, it was a public place. He was a more high profile figure. What, why do you think it, it hit you at that point? Well, I'm in the middle of Manhattan. I'm really yeah. not a professional hit guy. I did right. murder. I'm not a professional hit guy yet. Mm-hmm. So I'm in the middle of Manhattan. There's a door guy and he's harassing me to move. Yeah. I don't want to shoot him. I mean, the woman, I looked at her. I don't want to hurt her. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm nervous and I'm ready. But a couple of more cars pulled up, one after the other. It was the Gallo gang. Uh-huh. And, they, and they got out of cars. They had long trench coats. But I saw when they opened up the trench coat, they had, whether it was shotguns or rifles, long barrel guns. And I knew for sure. I says, as soon as I make a move and I shoot him, I'm going to get killed. I knew it. There was no way around it. So I didn't do it. But I thought... At that time, I was in big trouble that I didn't do it. He walked in to the place. I let him slide. When oh. I was walking back up to the corner where they were waiting for me, the poster goes, um, I said, I'm in big, big trouble now. They grabbed me, they hugged me, they kissed me. And they said, Sammy, you know what's good? If you would have killed them, they would have killed you. And we would have thought you were the biggest jerk off in the world. We know you got balls enough to shoot, but you got fucking brains too. We like that. We'll get them at another time. So I, I actually, it was a good thing. They liked that I used my head in the situation, and uh, I dealt with it. In other words, I got the head. I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna deal with it one way or another. And I dealt with it, and I chose not to do it at that particular point. So they know you're tough. You're starting to get the respect uh, with your brain as well. And as we know with Joey Gallo, he would ultimately be killed uh, yeah. you know, down the road. Did it surprise you when you heard about it? Did it surprise you that he, he didn't have all those people with him at Umberto's? I mean, he had a few people, obviously. But, you know, the, the alleged shooter, Sonny Pinto, and he, it was fairly easy for the most part for him to do that. Uh, did that surprise you that he wasn't so beefed up as far as security like he was with you? It really did. It did. You know what it is? When we're with, you know, we make decisions. If a guy is with his family or, you know, you you write him a pass. You don't want to hurt his family. You don't want to do it in front of a guy's family. So I think that was more or less the thinking. So when he went in that restaurant with his family, his wife, his kid, and whoever was with him, there was a this. A few people would have. I think he must have thought, I'm pretty safe. They ain't going to do it here, yeah. Right. And and the guy who owned the restaurant was Umberto's clam house, was Manager Horse, who was a captain in the Genovese family. Right. They weren't, you know, he was in, at war in the Colombo family. It was an internal thing. So he probably figured they wouldn't do it here. Right. And they wouldn't do it in front of my family. He dropped his guard. And the guys were in a club who saw him. They called Manny the horse on the phone and told him the situation. And he said, do what she's got to do. It's okay. He had nothing to do with the hit, but he gave him his blessing. And they went in and did it. And that was that for Joey Gallo. That's probably the only uh, known hit ever in front of a family, right? I don't know of any other ones. Maybe you do, but it, it's well, definitely... Um, Definitely not yeah, normal. You generally don't. That's how I got transferred from the Colombo family. 
I had a problem with Shorty's brother, Ralph Spiro. Right. Um, it's a long story. I won't tell the whole story, but I had a problem with him. And uh, I went to his house to kill him. And I went right to his door. And we were like good fellas. We all knew each other's families. We were in, in and out of each other's houses. And when I went there, I, I rang the bell. Usually I walk in, but I rang the bell. And his wife came in, came to the door, and she says, uh, what's up? I had a gun already out next to my ass behind me. And I said, do, do me a favor, call Ralph. I, I need to talk to him. Something came up. And she says, is there a problem? Because he left in the, in the, in the in, it was like a rush. Is there a problem? I said, no, no, no problem. And as I was turning to walk away, she saw the gun. And uh, she told Ralph and Shorty, and they knew I was going to kill him. You know, if you heard the whole story, I said mm -hmm. it a bunch of times. But, right. and there was going to be a, a, a thing that we're going to, you know, because I was going to do it, right in front of his family, right in his house. Um, they, they That really bothered them. And they weren't going to kill me, but they were going to give me a beating, that, a, a real vicious beating by 10, 12 guys. And uh, a guy, Johnny Rizzo Sr., made guy in the Gambino family, knew about it, heard about it. He told me not to go. And I said, I got to go. Those are my people. I got to go. I can, what do you want me to do, run away? And uh, he wanted to come with me. He came with me, he talked to Shorty, and uh, he said uh, what Ralph did. Now, I'll give that to you real quick, too. Otherwise, I'll leave people in the dark. Yeah. There was a guy, Ralphie Ranga, who was with us. He came out of prison, real tough guy, real good guy. He goes on a, on a stick-up with, with another crew, and he, he gets shot 10 or 11 times in a shootout with the police. Gets in the car, dies in the car on the way home. They put him in a parking lot. And uh, it was like a, a tragedy for us. And I was in this bullshit bar in Shipshead Bay with the old man Johnny Rizzo and a bunch of other guys who were with uh, main, not made guys, but associates in different families. And uh, a woman came in, you know, teased up blonde hair, mini dress. She came in with a guy, and Rizzo was breaking my chops. I think this woman's looking at you. And I said, come on, bro, because we always joking with each other. I said, she's with a guy. Come on. And stop breaking balls. And before you know it, she got up. The guy went to the bedroom. She was coming over, and Louis Molito was with me and my Goombada Alley boy. And they said, you know, I think she's looking right at you, bro. Go over. Talk to her. See what she wants. And as I started going over to talk to her, it was a real dark, dingy shithole. Um, it was Ralph's wife. It was two weeks after he was dead. And I had told her, I said, uh, what are you doing here? And who's this guy? She said, Sammy, life goes on. Two weeks. Said, wow. Yeah, I said, the life goes on, but it's two weeks. He's not even cold yet. And she told me, she said, Sam, I, I see the way you used to look at me. You know, I could chase him, me and you, me and you. I told him, get the fuck away from me. And I got real angry. The guy came out of the bar. Right, all my friends stood up right away. He caught the move. And he came over. He was a little shaken up. I said, listen, get this, get her. I don't want to say the word there, but what I called her and get her out of here. You and her, while you can, get the fuck out of here. And left. Ralph tried to say that I tried to make her. And that's how I got in this whole situation. And then Ralph called my wife, I was married already, and said that Carmine Persico was going to kill me because I tried to make Ralphie Ronga's wife. And my wife was panicking and when I came home. And uh, she's crying and she told me what she was told. And I said, this life is very technical. Make sure every word you're telling me is the right way. And she told me the right way. My wife was not a liar. She didn't even understand what it was anyway. And I went in, I got a gun, and I went to his house, and I was going to kill him. Of course, it was a fake story. I didn't, right, that, because, 
you were trying to be respectful. You know, you were you were yeah. upset that you know she's in there kind of making an asset of a guy who just died two weeks before. And uh in turn, you know, these guys should have took your word for it. You were obviously respected. Uh so you had to well, do what they, they, they eventually did. When I went down, now let's get to the meeting. Ralph yeah. tried to knock me down. I was a rising star and he wanted his son to if the book's open to get made, he didn't want me to get made. He wanted his son to get made. He tried to knock me down a notch. Right. And uh so anyway. The, the, the hit didn't take place. Meetings took place. And sh- and the old man, Johnny Rizzo, came with me to this meeting where I was supposed to get hurt. And he shorty, there was 10, 12, 15 guys standing on the corner waiting. And shorty walked over and he they said, John, this is none of your business. And John said, no, I know it's not. But I know what you're doing. I know the plan. I, I, I was told. I know what's going to happen to him. It's your family, your business. You could do it. I just want to tell you what happened. And he told them what happened word for word, what I've just told you with this woman, Ralphie's wife. And he says, if you don't believe me, there was guys from four different families there. And he mentioned all of their names. Louis Melito, Ali Boy, Mikey Monsonell. They were all there. They all watched it. You want to talk to all of them? This, what he, this story about him trying to make it, that's all total bullshit. And then he says, Ralph called up his wife and told him that Kamei Persico was going to kill him. And Shorty gave me a hug and he says, I knew this, I knew it was, I, I had a feeling that this wasn't a true story. And he created a big sit down between Rizzo, who was in the Gambino family, Carlo Gambino, the head of the Gambinos, and the head of the Columbos talked. And I was supposed to go to a meeting with them. I did. Uh, Carmine Persico was away. His brother, Ali Boy Persico Sr., was in charge. He was the concierge, but at that time, he was acting boss. And uh, he said, listen, there was a sit down amongst the two families. Sammy, you did the right thing. We want to kill Ralph, but he shot his brother or not. Of course, if you would have got killed, you, your wife would have thought it came from Carmine. Just for that alone, we should kill him. But what you did is wrong by going to his fucking house. Right. What are you going to do? Shoot him in front of his wife, bro? Right. And uh, we can't keep this together. The Gambinos are talking for you. We're going to transfer you. We're we're always going to be friends. We want your word that you're not going to hurt Ralph. And then we're going to transfer you to the Gambino family. And that's how I wound up getting transferred over to the Gambino family. So it was pretty amicable. I mean, you obviously were still close. You know, you, you weren't going to work with them directly. But you move to the Gambinos. You start slotting in with a guy, Tato Arello, who you've talked about openly. He was kind of your, you know, in a way, I'm not sure he's the only mentor, but he was the quasi guy that, really kind of grew you up in the streets. He's from Brooklyn. Tell me about Tato, because he goes way back. I mean, he's a guy that's, you know, in there from the beginning, uh, essentially. Yeah. Well, that day we had the meeting. I'm in a car with Tato. I brought him to the meeting. I was supposed to bring him there. And now on the way back, he said, listen, from this point on, you're with us. If you embarrass us, if you do anything wrong, we'll, we won't even hesitate. We'll kill you in a second. He says, I want you by my club every single day. I'm going to know everything about you. I'm going to know when you get a pimple. I'm going to know when you're going to get laid. I want to know everything about you. So you're going to sit with me every day. I'm going to know you better than you know yourself. And uh, that was the decision. So I knew I had to live with that. And I went to every day. I got to love the man. He was great. He actually looked like my father, short like him, and a sharp guy, stay in the club. He would be in the backyard, almost like what you saw in uh, The Godfather is. He would roll up his pants and put galoshes on his shoes, cigar hanging out of his mouth with a hose, hose in the, he had fig trees, orange trees, tomato plants, and he would have his little meetings in his backyard. And I would sit there and listen to him for hours. A lot of times we would smooth and he would talk about growing up and his friends. 
And I used to say, well, who's your friend? And he would say, Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, Al Capone. The stories blew me away. To me, those were legends as a kid growing up. And these were like his, you know, his best friends. Like They built like, them up, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy. I mean, I used to hear these stories, and and he, me and him would smooth, and, and he would groom me and talk to me. And, and I he's, there, I mean, he's kind of schooling you the way they schooled him in a way uh, and, and keeping the line of, of the next in line coming up. You know, that right. that's something that I hear a lot about. I, there was a guy that I had on recently that, you know, he was close with Vincent Asaro, and he, he told me that Vinny Asaro was always trying to, you know, make the next person, you know, the future, building this thing. And so he he's a great mentor to have, Tato. You know, that was the guy. Um, yeah. event, eventually you meet you know, people like Paul, who you know, was obviously very high up. He's Carlo's cousin. Um, but, but I want to hear more. And I'm always curious about making ceremonies. You know, your goal, obviously, is to become a made man and get your button. You become one in 1976. Tell me about that night. Who was there? What kind of people oversaw that 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 night for you? Well, I really I really had no intentions of becoming a made guy. The books were closed in 1955. So really, you they never weren't open. Okay, I never knew that. So I never really thought about getting made because I thought they never were going to open. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. you're talking 20 years later. Sure. Before they opened the books in 75. So to me, I was just an associate, and that's my position. I would I couldn't grow more because the, the the books were closed. Yeah. So everybody knew that. So I really wasn't my goal to get made. My goal was to be around him. And I'm a street kid, and I'm learning, and I'm learning a different life. In the Colombo family, it was like, well, I'm in a war, I'm in a murder, shoot this guy, beat up this guy, break this guy's legs, punch this guy out. It was all well rough type of shit. Now I'm in the Gambino family, and it was a whole different ballgame. They were in businesses and unions and different things, different stories, different. I'm going to give you a quick story to see the difference in mentality. One of those days, he says to me, after knowing me for months and months and months, he said, listen, today I got a meeting in the backyard. You come and sit with me. Oh, don't open your mouth. Just sit there and listen. So. You know, of course, I'm flattered. I'm going to do it. And I go and sit there. And he tells me a guy is coming in. A guy comes in and he tells a story about his friend and his wife. His wife and his one of his best friends that he's, he tried to make her or something. And uh, Tato at the end of the conversation tells the guy, don't do nothing. I'll get back to you. And he dismisses it. And he tells me, he says, if you were me, what would you do? I said, I don't know. I, I would get a couple of young thugs like me and go give his friend a, a good beating. And he said, good. I already know you got balls. And now I know you're stupid. And me, it was like, I love the guy. He called me stupid. <laughs> I thought it hurt a little bit, but... Uh, he says, tomorrow, I'm going to have the other guy here. Come in here at such and such a time. I was at, I was there two hours early because I wanted to hear the, side, the other side. And now I am in the back with him. The other guy comes in and tells me a whole different story. She's a beautiful woman. The guy, inside and out. He loves her. It's his friend, his best friend's wife. She is beautifully, she's, you know, a face and a figure, she's beautiful. But inside out, she's a beautiful person, is what he meant to talk to her and everything. And she actually is defending him, saying, he didn't hit on me, he didn't do that. He's saying something, he gave me a compliment. So anyway, he tells the guy the same thing. Don't do nothing and leave, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. The guy leaves, he tells me, now what would you do? I said, I don't know. One of them is lying, or I, I really don't know what to do no more. He said, good, good. He says, see those two, two things on the side of your head, your ears? You suppose God gave you those things so you can listen with both ears, both sides. 
There's two stories. One guy could have one story. One guy could have another story. And the truth is somewhere in the middle. That's my job to figure out. You just don't jump into things. You got to hear both sides. You got to hear both sides. And he says sometimes they're not lying either one of them. It's the way they perceive it. People perceive things in a different way. So then he says, listen, I'm having both of them come down tomorrow. Be here again. And I'm there. Both of them come in. Long story short, they talk. They're almost in tears. They're hugging each other, apologizing to each other. And they leave. He says, see, it's a misunderstanding. Now, you would hurt this guy for nothing. It's not that we don't or can't use violence. We can. But remember, it's at the last resort. If you're ever sitting in my chair, and I got a feeling someday you might be. Right. You have to think. Use your head. Yeah. Use violence as a last resort. Not so as the- this was totally different than the Colombo family. They would have made me break this guy's ass. They, hope you, they, they couldn't care less what the truth was or whatever. Well, one thing we know about the Columbos, and, and I want to ask you because you know you know it intimately more than anybody, they, they were always a, a family that was dysfunctional. There was a lot of leadership that were just lunatics, as you said, just running around killing people for no reason. They were always in wars, you know, even into the 90s. You know, and then you look at the Gambinos, a very successful family. They, they had a lot of pragmatists that were, were more or less looking to you know, talk things out. Obviously, that was why the Columbos were like that, right? They, they just – they never – had that leadership like a Tato or people like that that were willing to, to think like that. Absolutely. They, 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 they didn't have the older wise guys who sat back, wise men. I don't mean by wise, uh, wise right. would, right. you know, and sat back and thought and relaxed and used violence as a last resort. That that wasn't their thing. Their thing was to make money, to run unions, and uh, they were good people. They helped the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. They did certain things. You know, I heard a lot of people saying they recruited kids. That's bullshit. They didn't recruit nobody. They recruited kids who were tough, like me. Street kids, thugs. Mm-hmm. And they recruited us and made us a little more polished. Maybe we were a big part of the life. But they didn't go recruiting people. Like what I kind of money? Stories. What, what kind of money are you making at this time, Sammy? Nothing. Not much. Not much. No. That didn't no. come until you're made. Well, I made. You know, I, I was from score to score. I made a score. You know, it was a big shot, and then I'm broke, and uh, I'm back to you know. So uh, I mean, when I first got married, I, uh, I, I was two months, three months behind in rent. Yeah. But, you know, I started in business, and what happened is one day Tato told me to take a ride with him to go to Paul Castellano's house, and I did. And Paul Castellano was living in a mansion. The house was humongous. They called it the White House. The White House. Yeah. And uh, I met him, and he knew of me already uh, because they talked for me. So I, he knew who I was and what I did. But he was complaining about the heat in his house. He couldn't get hot water to a shower. And uh, I had a plumbing company with my brother-in-law, Eddie Garofola, and uh, we had a couple of people working for us. We were doing some work. Um, and I said, Paul, where's the, the, the heaters and everything? He says, down in the basement. He said, why? I says, I got an engineer who's working for us. and I got a plumbing company. Maybe I could bring him here, check it out, and maybe fix it. He shook his head and he says, all right, make arrangements and, and bring the guy. You know, don't send him. You bring him and stay with him and check it out. And I did that. When we got back to the office, my office, and uh, the guy says, the pipe the, is so, his bathroom is so far away from this boiler room where the heat comes from. By the time it runs through those pipes and gets there, it cools off. 
So he's lucky if he gets lukewarm showers. He can't get a hot shower. So I said, how do we fix that? He said, we, there's electrical wires they wrap around the pipe. Every so often, they go on automatically when, the, when you use the water. So the pipes start to get hot. So now as the hot water is coming out, it never really cools off. It's hitting hot spots and it's staying warm. I fixed his pipes. And he was really blown away with that. Very happy, I bet. Very happy. And then he says, I hear you're doing things with unions and business and stuff. I said, yeah, I just got a drywall company. I says, uh, the unions, I, you know, I, 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 some of them I try to bully, some of them I bribe. But I'm having problems with some of the unions. And uh, he started helping me. He liked the fact that I was working with unions. And then he started using me, sending me on things his problems to, to go sit down with another family to resolve a problem. And my business businesses started to grow. My knowledge of the unions were grow, was growing. And I was in and out of construction all of my life as a kid. So I understood a lot of that. And uh, he took a liking to that. And that's when money, my money's really started to grow. I mean, those are a couple of good people to be motivated by, Todd Arello and then Paul. I mean, Paul was a huge earner, made a lot of money. So also, obviously, I never knew that, actually. That's how you got indebted to him. You, you fixed some of his uh, plumbing issues. That's uh, that's fascinating. So you become, you know, a made guy in the, the mid-70s. Who was at the – who else was made with you that night? Who else was there? Uh, Todd Arello's son. Okay. There was 10 guys got made the same day I did, but Todd son was one of them a bunch of guys who got made and um, you know that's a funny story too because uh, before I went to the get made I was in a, a bar and one of the guys Sally Abadis he was a captain in the Colombo family I was in a bar and it, it was more like a half a disco type of bar mm -hmm. and uh, he came over to me put his arm around me big guy and he gave me a kiss on the cheek and he said, Sammy, I love you, bro. How's, how's it been with, uh, with Kato? He's a good man. I said, I love the guy. He's a great guy. And everything is good. He said, tell me something, Sammy. You were really going to shoot Ralph right in the fucking house? He started <laughs> laughing. And so I says, bro, I was so hot. You know, I was, and I was really wrong. I love his wife. Ann is a really good person. I would, I, I would, I would, I would have been, I would have done it, but I would have been sick. But yes, that's what I went there for. I had the gun out. I wanted to shoot him right at the fucking door when he came to the door. So he's laughing. And then he said, Sammy, Tato's sending your name around. I didn't know even what that meant. I said, what, what do you mean? He says, good things are going to happen for you. <laughs> I, I can't explain it because he was a, he was a main guy. Right? He was a captain. And uh, he said, uh, he's got good intentions for you. Someday he's going to tell you I got an appointment. Wear a suit, a white shirt, and a tie. It's going to be a great night for you. Don't, <laughs> don't, worry, don't worry. So I kind of caught a vibe, you know, something big was going to happen. And uh, and his son, you know, probably had a better idea of what was going to happen because he was telling me, we're going to meet my father. We're going to go to this meeting. He didn't want to tell me what was going on either. And that's the night I went. And I, matter of fact, when I was waiting, there was 10 guys. They called the guy down. Or, you know, somebody came up, grabbed the guy, brought him down, and then another one, and he never came back up. So after about the fifth or sixth guys, I turned to his son, Charlie, Charlie boy, and I said, Charlie, this is fucking weird. Everybody who goes down don't come back no more. I said, I wonder what's going on. I was breaking balls. So Charlie said, no, where we go? We'll be all right. We'll be all right. I do. So I went down the stairs. Well, I was the last guy. And I walked down the stairs. It was an old house, wooden stairs, creaking. And it was at Frankie the Wop's uh, house, right? Yes. Yeah. Wow. You got some information on that. Yeah. Well, I do the... my digging, Sammy. Come on. Yes. It was good. Very good, gangster. Yeah. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, it was Frank the Wop's house. Went down. It was an old pool table or something with a big piece of plywood sheet. 
there was the nine guys who went down and each guy was proposed by somebody, a captain. So there was 18 guys sitting around a table, Tiffany lamp hanging over probably for the pool table, mm -hmm. Smokey, um, Paul was standing up. There was an empty chair next to him. And the guy told me, he says, go stand next to Paul Castellano. You know, he is, of course I know who he was. And he said, just sit there or stand there, tell him, you know, whatever he tells you to do. And uh, he asked Tato to get up. Of course, Tato proposed me to become a made guy. And uh, Tato got up, came over. And uh, he pricked my finger. Cut, cut my finger open a little bit. And I put my blood on a saint. And I repeated the oath when Paul t t told me certain things in the oath. And uh, I took this oath and we locked in the whole room, stood up and locked in. And uh, when the oath was done, he told me, at this point, you're a friend of ours. You're a made guy. I'm the father of this family. And there's people's ranks. You'll be introduced to all of them. Tato proposed you. You're, he's your godfather now. And uh, we live by the oh, by this private secret society, and we die by it. We never break it. Uh, he he uh, said a whole bunch of different rules and regulations, and he said, "As of today, you're reborn. Everything you did before here, we don't never want to know about it. We don't care." It's unimportant to us. You're born as of today. This is before God, country, and family. This comes first. If your son is dying and he's in the hospital and you're standing at the hospital and somebody comes and whispers to you that the boss wants to see you, you leave the hospital immediately and go see the boss, me. And he said all of those things, of course, really going to happen that they're going to call you away from your son's deathbed, but they just try to give you how important this is and, and how the secret society is and a brotherhood. And, and as of that day, I walked around the table, I kissed him on both sides of the cheek and, and other people all the way around the whole place. And as of that day, I was a made guy. <laughs> One, uh, one, one situation I want to ask you about is, uh, and obviously, you know, it's your family in a way, uh, your brother-in-law, Nick Chibetta, you know, you were asked to deal with him eventually. Can, can you tell us about that story? I mean, obviously, you know, Paul is, you know, teaching some good things, but he's also going to eventually ask you to do certain things. And, you know, th this was a big situation for you, right? Well, it's a situation that I'm not going to talk about because it hurts my family. I did a video on it um, and I spoke about it. And in that video, I explained what was done. So you could look up that video. Yeah. And, uh, and I said in that video, I'm never going to discuss this again. Brother-in-law. But, uh, and Are I was you, part of it. So I will say that? that much for your audience or you. But to go into that story, I'd really rather not. Um, so it's a it's a tough situation. That story. Yeah, absolutely. I want to yeah. ask you about John Gotti because w when did you meet John? Uh, I was already made in '76. He just got out of prison, I believe, in '76 or '77. I was very very tight with Frank and Chico. He had a club. Every time he opened up a club, a gambling club or an after hour club, I always went to, to bolster his club up a little bit. And I was there with Frank and Chico's father, Boozy, who was a main guy was in Tyler's crew as well. And uh, John Gotti came into the club with a bunch of guys, with his little entourage. And Boozy said, do you know this kid, John Gotti? I said, I heard of him. He actually did a me a favor 
a friend of mine got in trouble in prison, uh, something with drug, drugs and the black guys, and he stepped to the plate and helped them and straightened it out. The guy didn't get hurt. So he did that because he heard that the guy was with me or close to me in prison. And then I heard of him, but I really don't know him. I didn't grow up with him. I don't know him. I hear some good things about him. He says, yeah, he's going to be one of us. So he wasn't made yet. So I think he got made in 1977. And he came from Queens. I came from Brooklyn. It was a different neighborhood. I didn't grow up with him, and I didn't know him that well. But I heard of him. I knew who he was. When do you so. start? When do you start really kind of communicating with him? Because, like I, you know, we'll see movies, which I think the one thing I've always said about movies is not, none of it is is for the most part. It, some of it's true, but like there's a film about John Gotti, and in the film they make it sound like, uh, you know, you meet him and and you guys kind of become very close right away, and you know they even had you in the one film involved with some things that would happen with allegedly you know, some of the the. The kid, the kid dies, and all that sort of thing. When do you start really doing things with John and, and interacting with him more? I don't do too much interacting with him. He's more thuggerish. He's more in the street, yeah. Uh, you know, street crimes and stuff like that. I'm more into the business area. But when my mother died, he came with an entourage, showed a tremendous respect. When my father died, the same exact thing. Um, and one day he came down, one of his sister's sons was married to this girl. Uh, I don't even want to say her name, but she was married to some girl. And she used to come around our neighborhood. She went with a lot of different guys. And I was in, in Doc's bar. And uh, John Gotti came down to Doc's bar with a couple of guys. My guys were there. They weren't made yet. Stymie, Michael DeBat, a whole bunch of guys. And he was asking about this girl. And he was a little rough and stuff. And Stymie told him, listen, this is Sammy's joint. We're all with Sammy. Mm -hmm. We don't know about your, your niece or whoever she is. And we don't give a fuck about her. We're not here to answer your questions. We told you she's not here. We don't know too much about her. And this is Sammy's joint. Talk with Sammy. And uh, he didn't take that answer very well. He was pushing a little bit. Sammy gave a nod. And one or two guys slipped away and loaded up. When they came back, another one or two walked away. By the time they were done and John picked up on it, he was aware of it. They were all loaded up. And then Sammy had told them, Listen, I told you four, five, six, ten times now. This is Sammy's joint. We're not going to answer none of your fucking questions. I don't know who the fuck you are or who you think you are. But do yourself a big favor. Get in the car and get the fuck out of here. And go talk to Sammy. And John left. So John came. Well, but I heard about it and I said, what you say? And what just do? And they told me what happened. So I said, well, he's a main guy. You can't do that. Bro. You can't talk to them. You can't do that. He said, Sam, we don't know who he is. We were polite. We told him we didn't know nothing. He kept bullshitting about this girl. And uh, we told him a couple of times, and he just didn't want to take an answer. We told him that you, this is your joint. He didn't show no respect. If he would have continued, he would have got hurt. We would have killed him. Oh my God. I said, listen, don't get it, don't get too aggressive. But when I talked about it with John, I said, John, he said, Would you guys load up? I said, they were loaded to the gills. But I'm gonna tell you something, bro. My guys ain't gonna take no fucking shit. They didn't know who you are. Right. You would have went a little bit too far. Yeah, they would have took you the fuck out. And uh, so they laughed, you know, no big deal. And he knew he was in the wrong. Once they mentioned my name, he should shut the fuck up and come to me. He so shouldn't even, keep on with these guys. They don't know him. So even home. then, John is uh, throwing his weight around. We got close. close. Right. right. 
So even then, he's throwing yeah, his he weight around. Yeah, he always throws his weight. It comes out with stuff like that. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of how. But. Yeah, that's how we would get to the kind of you know the the big the big one the big story. But I think it's kind of a lead up because he always tries to. It almost has always been inferred that he created the idea to to get rid of Paul, and it, it really centered around his negligence and his people's negligence for selling narcotics, as you know. And you know, Paul was going to kill him. There was a rule against not selling drugs, and his brother and his people were doing it. And you know, he basically, in a way, just got. He wanted to get to Paul before Paul got to him. But, you know, ultimately that this hit was set in motion. Um, you had kind of alluded to you were close to Paul. You had been around him for years. Um, what kind of persuading did it take for you to get on to to that agreement and to do that? Well, it all started that he, not only that they were all doing drugs and there was a rule, you do drugs, you die, but – he, when they got caught on tape, Angelo, his right-hand man and everybody, when they got caught on tape, they were not only talking about drugs and dealing drugs. They were talking about all the bosses and all the different families. Right. They were talking about all kinds of fucking shit that you should never be talking about. And it resulted in subpoenas. It, it, it became big, um, the, what he got caught with. So now Paul was trying to get those tapes. He couldn't get the tapes at first. And uh, he would have took them out. Now, TB, who's a guy in the family, he made guy, he became a captain later after the hit, but told me that Angelo wants to see me in Queens. That's, he grew up with John. That's John's right hand man. So I went to go see Angelo and I knew about the problem that they had. And Angelo says, well, what? He said, we're going to take Paul out. We're in big trouble. You? No, he said to me, John, of course. I said, you're going to take him out. He's the boss of bosses. And you're going to take him out. And um, I said, and you and John, now, you're asking me to help you take him out. Yeah. I said, Angelo, where is fucking John now? You're here. Where is John? He don't think this meeting. Well, he was busy. Well, this meeting with me, you're asking me to kill. I'll help you kill the boss of bosses. And he's busy doing <laughs> what? What is this? Like, you're, like you, you do me a favor. Could you bring home a container of milk for me? When you go shopping, what the fuck? This is what you, you're asking me to kill the boss of bosses or, or help you kill. I said, listen, Ange, you guys are so fucking wrong and they're caught up like up to your eyebrows. And I understand your problem, but I'm not going to say yes and I'm not going to say no. When I get in the car, I'm going to go home. I'm going straight to Staten Island, straight to Frank and Chico's house. And I'm going to tell him. I'm not going to tell nobody else what you just said, but I'm going to tell him. And he says, oh, he'll be with us. He'll be with us, too. Yeah, well, we'll see what he says. And uh, then I'll get back to it. And I left. And I went to Frank and Chico's house, and we discussed it, me and Frank and Chico. I didn't want to be part of the hit. I said, listen, Frank, yeah. you're hitting the boss of bosses, bro. I'm not, I didn't get caught on these fucking tapes. I'm not in this bullshit. You're not in it. We're going to be in a fucking huge war. He has people in Italy. He has the Westies. The whole commission is going to go crazy. We're going to hit a boss without permission. We're going to be in a war, bro. We, we may not survive this war. So he said, Sammy, he made a lot of mistakes. At that point, Paul did make a lot of fucking mistakes. Right. Bad mistakes that shouldn't be made. So Frankie said... Listen, I think we saved John and his whole crew. Change goes in Austria back to what it's supposed to be and make it the right way. So I said, well, I really, really don't want to. But uh, he said, Sammy, remember what he did to your family 
that's going back to that story with my brother in law. Mm-hmm. I said, listen, I, I know that. I understand it. I live with it. I hate it. But I don't want this. I don't want me to say yes out of revenge. The token goes in Austria. Revenge is a different thing. But I, it fired me up again, my brother-in-law situation. And uh, right. I said, listen, Frankie, I love you like a brother. You're 14 years older than me. It's always been close. Me and you, we grew up. You were like, you're my big brother. And uh, you are going to be in it. I could see that. And uh, I don't want to walk away from you. But um, if we do this, I want you to be the boss. And he said, Sammy, I could be his underboss. He can't be mine. He's got an ego like the Empire State Police. He's not stupid. We could make him the boss. Me and you will be the power behind the throne. We'll make him right. We'll make the family right. And I give you my fucking word, if he acts the fool like he acts... And you don't do the right thing, we'll kill him. I'll become the boss and you'll become my other boss. You feel that strong with it? Yeah. And I shook his head. Once I shook his hand, I was it. Hook, line, and sinker. But you were also gonna and, put uh, the you were also gonna put the plan together too. You wanted to be in control of that, right? Well, no, I didn't want to be. We did, it took eight months to plan and try to plan. get this yeah. done, and we just couldn't get it together. We couldn't get it done right. Mm-hmm. The, our meeting came up. Now we were living in October. We were starting to worry that this might leak out. So Frankie said, "Sammy, I think me and you, we go in Joe Watts's house. It's a maid. Get rid of the maid. We'll live in the maid's quarter with a couple of guys, because." I'm afraid if it leaks out, well, me and you are going to get caught short. We'll live there. You tell your guys, somebody comes looking for you on Tuesday at 8 o'clock for a meeting. If my guys tell me the same thing, then he knows and we're going to get hit. The war is on. But we can't be just walking around like suckers now. Right. If it leaks out, we're talking to too many people now. So we, we went and we bunked in in October the early part of October, and uh, we were living together. And at one point, a meeting came about to Frankie and Chico, and it was told that he was going to be in a meeting in Spark Steakhouse with Jimmy Brown and uh, Danny Marino and a whole bunch of guys, and Frankie was invited to that meeting as well. He was already a powerful captain. Um, I was an acting captain. Um, so when we were in the room, uh, basement and we were talking, John was there and, uh, I said, I think I got it. What? We'll kill him at Sparks Steakhouse. So John said, are you crazy, bro? It's in the middle of Manhattan that we... Right before Christmas, there'd be tens of thousands of people packed, cops on every corner. You losing your mind? So I said, No, I don't think I'm losing my mind. Here's what's happening, bro. We can't get him. We can't get a spot. We know a couple of things. Here's what we know right now. We know that the meeting is in Sparks. We know what time it is. You can't park there. It's going to go right in front of Sparks. People stop their car there. They give them the keys and they go park the car. So we know where he's going to park the car, the restaurant, the block, the time. And we're going to use all of those fucking people and cops and every fucking body else for massive confusion. Mm-hmm. When those shots start, there'll be a massive fucking confusion. And we got to wiggle into it. We need a big crew and it's a do or die hit. But we're playing with this for six, seven, eight months now. It's going to come out. What are we yep. going to wait until we hit? We got to just do this it. This is an ideal spot. John said, that's crazy. Frankie DeChico said, listen, John, you have the problem. We're here to fucking help you. Sammy's already been in two mafia wars, two. 
This will be his third. He's a planner. He's smart. You don't want him to do it? You don't want to do it? Then me and Sammy are out. Do it yourself. And John immediately said, okay, I'm in. I'm, I'm okay. So he planned nothing. Matter of fact, he was my driver in the car. So you were outside. You're outside of the hit, right? I was, no, in the car with him. I had a walkie-talkie. I was controlling. There was 11 guys on the hit. I was right. controlling the hit. I put the whole hit together. And I had a 357 Magnum. I was also going to be a backup shooter. If I had to come out of the car, I would shoot. I had a gun. John was nothing more than my driver on this hit. I know it's going to sound crazy, but there's documentaries. There's every fucking thing about yeah. it. There's facts with the agents and everybody. That's what happened. And that's how, how I planned it. And uh, I'm gonna. the night before, we were in Brooklyn in my office in the basement with all the shooters, everybody. It's the first time we told the shooters and everybody who was going to be on this hit, who was going to get hit, that it was Paul. And I made the speech to them. I told them, I said, this is a do or die fucking hit. They got to be killed no matter what. That's the first thing. Don't hurt no other people. If uh, somebody comes in and tries to interfere with it, shoot them. If there's cops, we're going to shoot it out. Some of us might die there. Maybe we're all going to die there. We're going to make history. But we, he's going to go. The both of them are going to go. Simple as that. One of the fucking shooters who was chosen to be one of the shooters said to me, says, Sammy, I'm in. And if we don't make it, I'll meet you in fucking hell. I turned around to everybody else and I said, that's exactly what the fuck I want to hear. It's exactly what we're going to do. Did and everyone volunteer or did you pick? No, we picked. But it's not, it's, it doesn't matter. They volunteered, picked. It's right. not that we put out a vol you know, who's who wants to come. We talked to right. them. Right. And we knew who to go. Every guy there could shoot. But you don't need everybody to shoot. You need the shooters to shoot. Right. You need the other guys to back up the shooters. And we told them, nobody moves. I don't care if we're getting hit. If the whole pack moves, we move together. If you move before the pack and you run, keep running because you're going to die. We're going to kill you. Forget about cops. We're going to kill you. So... That was the Castellano hit. This was, we used that whole situation and exactly what I say then and I'm saying now happened. Those thousands of people fucking ran in every which direction. Cops didn't have a fucking clue what the hell was going on. And um, it was perfect. You got it done. One quick question on the hit. I, and if you don't know this, that's fine. But one of the individuals, allegedly one of their guns jammed. Is that true? Yes, it's true. Uh, Vinnie Savo. Artuso. Gun, Artuso. Artuso. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, uh, uh, his gun jammed. Matter of fact, well, right after the hit, we knew about that. John wanted to kill him. And we talked. We said, why, why the fuck? He didn't run. Yeah. His gun jammed. Yeah. He stood there with a gun jammed. He didn't run. He stood there. We're going to kill him because he jammed. Right. He stood there. He did what he had to do. He has no control over the fucking thing jammed. But he didn't run. He was going to, if he had a hit with the guy with a gun or fight, I mean, he would have did whatever he had to do. Why are we killing this guy? Right. And he didn't get killed, obviously. And he, he died, I think, not too long ago. Very recently, yeah. So John yeah. Be John becomes boss. Frankie's uh, very high up as well. You guys are in the upper echelon. Of the yeah, you're in the upper echelon of the family. But I want to quickly jump to '86. Frankie is 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 killed in a in a in a car bomb. I, I want to ask you, and this has been public. One of his family members believes you're involved with that. That that's complete nonsense, right? Absolutely. Absolutely nonsense. I, I know who it is. This guy, Joe Butteras, complete fucking asshole. And uh, he's a guy, not only is he an asshole, but 
Uh, he's a guy who he could be a maid. I had to ask Frankie one time because I knew Joe Butter. I knew his kids. And I said, how come he's – because all the DeChicos got made. Georgie DeChico, Boozy, they were all made, just about. Why didn't you make Butter? He says, well, there's a – he's got a, something in his history. Uh, I can't – I don't want to explain it, Sam. If I tell you what it is, we'll, we'll, we'll have to wind up killing him. Oh, all right, all right. I don't even want to hear it then. So he's a, that's what he was. And then he wanted to get made. So after I cooperated, I was on the stand. And he dreamt up this story to try to kiss ass with uh, John. And John would finally give him permission to get made. John wouldn't give him permission anyway. But that's what he was talking about. But uh, Frankie, uh, I love the guy. Um, why would I go against him? And why would I do that? I mean, if it was us on one side, John's on the other side, we it united as one. Why the fuck would uh, I have something to do with killing Frank and Chico? It, it doesn't even make sense. But then that's what this butter butter ass was his nickname, and butter ass butter mouth. Like the, he he died now. I would like to dig him the fuck up for just for saying that. And I yeah. just a skeleton there. I will shoot the fucking skeleton right in the head. That's what yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously, you've, you've conveyed throughout the, the whole talk that you're very close to Frankie. It makes no sense. And I, I think we all know kind of where that came from and, and who it came from. Um, I want to ask you a quick question. And, and I, we don't have all day, so I want to kind of I don't want to take all your time. But I have two questions I want to ask about. Um, there, there was a, a, a wiretap one time where you were to, uh, you, you talked regularly with Genovese people, Vincent uh, DiNapoli, you know, Vincent DiNapoli, right? Uh, yes. Big, big drywall guy. Was it true that the edict was if you ever mentioned Chin's name on camera or on tape, um, you were, you were kind of just told at one point you're going to get you know, the guy said you're going to get me killed by saying his name. Was that a, a major edict? If you said his name, that was a big kind of violation. Well, Chin was a you know uh, he was a super tough guy, and uh, he was a boss, and. Um, you know, Gigante, he got this by, he didn't want guys talking and getting caught on tape. Yeah. So he would say, this guy wants to see you. So if you went like that, uh, you're talking about the chin. You know who we're talking about. So he really actually got a lot of people in the habit and uh, of going like that. I, Paul did that to me once. He says, you're going to go see that guy? There's <laughs> a boss do, touching his chin. But you know, there's a guy in the Colombo family, I forgot his name, Joe something or other, who got caught on tape. Chin was fucking steaming. And uh, word was out, Chin even wanted to kill this guy or have him killed. But uh, they, they didn't kill the guy. Uh, but so he was really, you know, and it was easy to do. You know, you look, we're looking to protect each other anyway. You know, a lot of guys, a lot of times, Guys are caught on tape talking about me, uh, the, the little guy, because I'm short. Right. So they would say, the little guy, they would call me. Well, the, reason I own... ask, the reason I ask about Chin is because you've made a comment before that you had ideas to run into the social club and kill him with a machine gun. It, did you really feel that way? What happened is that before 90, before we got arrested, there was a case going to come down. Now, John created a plot. To, it's a brilliant plot, actually, to kill me. And he's up in the apartment where he's caught on tape. So this all falls into play. So he's telling Frankie Lacasio that more or less to spread it around that Sammy is killing union guys, taking over unions, he's killing business partners because he wanted to kill me. You can't just kill a guy who's a, you're on the boss, did a lot of work, bring in a lot of money. So he's got, he's trying to invent an idea on how he could kill me and without repercussions from the family. So he's trying to make up his story with all these lies who I killed all these fucking people and did all these things which weren't true. But he wanted to create that. 
Now, the final lie, the thing that would have broke the ca camel's back is that he gave me an order to kill Chin. I always thought it was Chin who killed Frankie. So when he told me, I think you were right, Sammy. I think it was Chin. I'm gonna, I, I heard some things, and I think you were right. I'm giving you the green light. Take them out. To me, it was music to my ears. Because when I knelt at Frankie's wake, I told Frankie the Chico, Frankie, my brother, whoever ordered this, whoever did this, whoever knew about it, I'm going to kill them. I give you my fucking word. This was my time to live up to my promise. So Chin was my promise to Frankie. I agreed. I set up my crew and I set up guys who were going to do it. A plan of how it was going to be. We would block the corner from where his club was. He had a big bay window. And I would have a guy pass by and grab a garbage pail that was filled with rocks and throw it right through the front window. A van would pull up. The doors would open. I would come out dressed with all kinds of shit because I know he's being watched. I would go through the window and kill him and whoever the fuck he was with. And I didn't know how many people he was going to be there. So we had an Uzi machine gun, an Israeli machine gun. We never really used it. Fucked around with it a few times. I says, I'll use that. Everybody's going to have heavy equipment. I'll get back in the van and go. We had cars that would stop. Once the van took off with me in it, the car would stop down the street so you can't pass the car. And he wouldn't have a gun or he wouldn't have anything. He would just block the street. So if a cop came, they couldn't, they couldn't follow his van. So I was making this plan. And he would have used that part of that plan to say, Sammy, you all know he was killing everybody, taking over everything. And now he came to me and he killed Chin. He wanted to take over the Genovese family. I love the guy, bro, but I had to kill him. That's to appease everybody could understand that. That was his plan. But it didn't work because the law, we had connections, told him that the indictment was coming down, a serious indictment, and he was on it. So he called me back and he said, Forget killing Chen. We'll do that at another time. He said, I want you to go on the lamb. When the indictment comes down, I'm on it. If you're not on the indictment, come back and run the family until I get out. Because he thought he could beat everything. If, I'm on, if you're on the indictment, then run the family from the lamb. And make your whole fucking connect. Stay on the lamb and run the family. He wanted to keep control of the family. So that's what stopped the hit on Chin. Or I would have killed him. And uh, later on, we find out with Gas Pipe, who cooperated, other people cooperated, that it was Chin and it was Gas Pipe who killed Frank and Chico. From some fucking grease ball from Italy came in. They had that plastic bomb. They put it under the car. I was there in the club with Frankie. Frankie, a lawyer, a guy came in, a May guy, uh, and said, ask Frankie for a lawyer's card. He says, I don't have it. It's probably in my car. I said, Frankie, want me to get it? He said, no, I'll get it, Sammy. And I stood and watched. He went in the car. He opened the passenger side. He sat in sideways, talking to the guy, opened up the thing. Gas pipe gave the order. And the bomb went off. It blew him six feet out of the car. The guy who he's talking to blew his toes off. Not a made guy in the Lucchese family. I came running across the street. The car was blazing and completely in shambles. And uh, I pulled him away. And as I pulled him away, his leg and his arm was not attached. A, a police van uh, come out of nowhere, pulled up, backed up. People were screaming, open the back. I went and put my arms on them to pick them up, to put them in the van. 
one hand went under his ass and he had no ass. It went straight through his body into his outside skin. Oh. And the other hand I had around his neck and I was yelling to that fucking butter ass was going through his pocket. Same guy who says I had something to do with it. And another guy, my brother-in-law was there, grabbed his fucking arm and leg. And we picked him up and got him into the back of the fucking van. I had a white on white shirt. My whole arm was in his body. When I came out and the van took off, I looked. I had no blood on me, nothing. The suction of the bomb went up, and when it sucked back out, it took blood, and he didn't have any liquid in his body whatsoever. So he died instantly. And then we had connections with the cops who told us that it was plastique that comes from Europe. Right. So... And later, I understood, you know, when I cooperated, I sat with the government and agents, and I got to know every little detail of it, the story and everything like that. So anyway, and that's how John got pinched talking about this thing, setting me up, all these bullshit stories, not realizing he's on tape. And that created the pinch. So when we came in, when I came in, he asked me to come back. I was in December, and uh, I was on the land for a couple of months. There's stories about that. And uh, I was at my niece's party. It was in October, early part of October. And I was already told, you got to go on the land. And I called my wife over. And I told them, I got, I have to leave. Where are you going? It's, it's, it's not important. When are you coming back? I don't know. A week, a month, a year, maybe never. I'm just going to go. But there'll be people around you, Eddie, my brother, there's people there, Hawk, my maid guys. There'll be people around you. Don't believe anything you hear. Don't believe the newspaper. Don't believe anything. You're not going to tell me anything? No. I'm not going to tell you nothing. There'll probably be government people, agents, cops. You know why I'm not going to tell you nothing? Because you don't know nothing. Tell them the truth. Tell them what you know. Because you know nothing. You could take a lie detector test. You're not going to know nothing. I want to make that. You're, you're not in this life. So I did that to protect her. And I went and I went uh, to, uh, started off in the Poconos. I ended up in Florida with uh, my driver's brother owned the boat company. And uh, we were there and uh, I stayed there a while. His brother invited me to a party. There was a couple of models. They modeled the boats, did the boats. And, uh, so I went to dinner with them and uh, hung out with them for a little bit. And one of the models asked me to dance, a little dance came up and I was dancing with her and she was kissing me and shit, a little bit on the neck. And uh, I wanted to be with her, but I couldn't get my wife out of my fucking head. Mm -hmm. She is sitting there shaking, crying, and I'm here with a girl. Right. And is this real goes in Austria? Mm -hmm. So I grabbed the guy, Louie, I said, listen, Louie, come here. I, I, I got to leave. I got to get out of here. He said, why? What the fuck did she say? She didn't say nothing. She's perfect. She didn't say nothing. It's me. I can't do this. It's not goes in Osho. And it's not. My wife is sick. I'm going to be dancing with her. I'm going to be in a room with her. I, I just can't do it, bro. I can't. She's beautiful. She's a good girl. I can't do it. I got to get out of here. And there I went to Atlantic uh, City or a maid guy. I went in the condo. I stayed there for a while. And then I got a message that John wanted me back in in a meeting. I had full beard by that time. Um, and I said, in, in, you know, the Ravenite and the Lily, there's fucking law there every day. They were already looking for me. There was even an article came out saying he's missing. We think he's dead which wasn't true, obviously. And uh, so 
I came back in. I saw my wife. Great meeting after all that time. And uh, I shaved and I got dressed. And the next day I went to Manhattan. We went in the club. We, I sat with John and Frankie LaCasso, a little espresso. The doors bursted open. FBI came in. And it was in 1990, December. And uh, they arrested me, John, and Frankie LaCasio. And Tommy Gambino got arrested too, somewhere else. And uh, we were busted on this case. And it was a result of the tapes of him talking about all that bullshit, to, the plot to kill me. Mm -hmm. It's all on tape. And how all those things were fake, they weren't true, and that they were chin and everything else. So, and then I, I went to prison with him. I was in prison with him for 11 months. The, I was in prison 22 years of my life, I, was, I did in prisons. The worst 11 months I did was with him. He didn't want to go to prison and it was him. It was his mouth. I wasn't even on those tapes. I'm into jail because of him. And he didn't want to go to jail. And at the end of the conversation, I could give you all them jail stories, but I'm not going to. We'll be here for three days. So at the end of the thing, he develops a plan with the lawyers. And he tells me, he says, Sammy, here's the, what's going to happen. You sound, I mean, they are, what I said about you, you sound like an animal. He didn't apologize. He said, I got a plan. I'm the boss. The streets needs the boss. I'm going to control the lawyers to say, you hear John complaining about him, this fucking animal. Killing people, taking over businesses, his partners. He wanted to kill Chidigandi. Poor John Gotti, it's not him. He lost control of him. You can hear it on the tape. Yeah. It's him. You're going to make the lawyers say that? Yeah. It, it's got to be that way. You got to go to prison for me to get out. Are you sure you want you want to do this? We're brothers, bro. They're the enemy. We about to, gotta fight them. Now, I can't fight them because I gotta sit there like a complete jerk off, like a potted plant. Listen to lies. And I'll say a word. My family will believe this because I'm not gonna answer. And you're gonna make the lawyers do that? So I'm fighting them, the lawyers, and you. You sure you wanna do that? Yeah. And I left. I wanted to kill him, but I couldn't. I was in prison. There's people all around, there's guards, things. But when I went in, I said, fuck the mafia, fuck John Gotti, fuck the whole thing. I quit, and I'm going to go on the other side. We're playing chess. You're going to fucking do this to me? I'll go on their side. I'll probably get killed. I'll be called a rat. I'll be called everything under the sun. I just didn't give a fuck no more. But that's exactly what I did. So even after, you know, I will go way back to 76. You took the oath. You did all this stuff. Um, you just kind of put in your head, I'm not doing life in prison for this guy who clearly wants to throw me under the bus. That'll be that. Uh, you just were in a state of mind where you weren't going to do any time for him. And listen, I get that. I understand. I get what you're saying. But I guess people, they'll always say to you, well, you, know, you knew the rules. You knew the game. Why'd you get into that world? Why not just kill John? Why, you know, what do you say to that, those people? Because again, Sammy, you know, deep down that, you know, you were you were close in Austria. You you we know that. You know yeah. what do you say to that? You know, I was in prison 
with a lot of black guys and people say things about certain yeah. people. And I would always say, don't point over to these people or yeah. that person. Walk in their fucking shoes first. Mm -hmm. Walk in my shoes, asshole, whoever you are. Right. And and you go to prison for the rest of your life. Yeah. I've been arrested all my life for murders and everything else. I never flipped on it. I talked to my children and everybody. Don't ever do this. I wasn't doing this. I heard a rap song just recently, and the guy says, you know, you're not going to do this uh, to me. I never betrayed anybody who didn't betray me in a rap song. Mm -hmm. And it hit me. I listened to this rap guy singing it. Who was the rapper? We got it. We does he know I you? Don't, You've heard I don't him? know his name. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But he, he was singing. There was another guy, a heavy set guy, uh, something in paradise, living in paradise, uh, a paradise against his paradise. Oh, Coolio! He just uh, passed away, actually, sadly. Did he? Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, yeah muscular guy, and, and he goes down on his knees on it. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't remember it good because I was dancing around with the hip hop. Gangsters music. Paradise. I know it. It's big. <laughs> you know what I said? I was dancing around to the rapper's music. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you could say a lot of things. <clears throat> and I, you know, when I was in the street, I was dead against people cooperating. But one thing I always said when I saw a good guy cooperate, or what I would call a good guy, a tough guy, or whatever. I would always turn around and say, I never said it. It's rat fuck. I, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Uh, maybe eventually I did. Uh, but I always said, I wonder why. What happened? What's the story behind it? And, uh, and again, I know a guy, a, a black guy who I did time with, Real tough guy, a good guy. I don't even want to mention his name because I think he's going to get a shot of getting out. I don't want to talk about him. But he did all kinds of things, stood up like a bastard. But when he went to jail, other guys are banging his wife. They beat up his mother. They took over his spots. They took his money. And he told them not to do a certain thing. They did it. And he gets pinched again and he faces a death trial. He can, they could put him to death. And he flipped. So where is him? I mean, you want to call him a rat? He took a life sentence and stood up. Mm -hmm. Then you do all these other things to him. He's pinched it again. I don't think he was worried about getting an electric chair or, or gas chamber or whatever they're going to do. But it was enough. Right. There could be a point in some people's lives enough. I got caught for my crime. I'll do my time. I've done it. My last pinch, after I cooperated, I got pinched again in Arizona. And uh, I don't even know what planet I was on. It's just ecstasy. I wasn't even had nothing to do, really had nothing to do with it. But my son was in trouble. My family was in trouble. And it came down to the wire. Long story short, Sammy, your son's facing 45 years with the government now. And because we had two cases and, and 25 years with the state. Why are they raising? What, what do they want? They want you. And I made a deal. I'll give you me. Like all my son. Like all my son-in-law. Like all, like all my family. I'll tell you whatever the fuck you want. You want me to take the weight for everything? Yeah. Yeah, all right. How many pills you want me to say? I bought, I sold, or whatever the fuck you Whatever you want to say, I agree. And I made a deal. Is that a wrap? I don't know what, you know, the terminology, somebody sitting home in his mommy's basement. You know, I'm in social me media and I, I hear these fucking would-be fucking gangsters bullshit, you know, whatever, making statements about people. It's easy to do. Well, look, Sammy, I'll tell you right now. I mean, I think even me in, in some of my previous years, you know, I think when you're young, you have this fuck this rap, fuck that rap. But I think as I've gotten older, I've realized, you know, you're someone I don't I'm not going to judge anyone. I didn't walk in your shoes. I wasn't facing the the, the penalty you were. Uh, I wasn't facing all this stuff. So to me, I just don't get involved with that life. So I don't have to face those decisions. But 
I understand what you're saying, where most of the people that are saying this are, you know, they never walked a minute. They never were anywhere near the streets. They have no idea what they're talking about. And you felt like there was no honor left. The people that you were involved with, there was no honor there. And, you know, I think as I've, I've gotten older, I've, I've, I've kind of gotten on the same page and understand. I want to ask you two questions because I don't want to keep you here all day. I know you got a life. Um, and maybe at some point, if you're willing, I'll come out and see you and we can have another conversation. Um, but I want to ask you about the Gaudis and then I want to ask you about uh, one other thing and we'll get you out of here. After you cooperated, you did your things. Um, there was a plot by John. You know, he kind of ordered his brother to, to according to him, you know, take care of a debt that needs to be paid. They sent a hit team out to kill you. Some of the people that you were very close to turned on you and decided to come and try to kill you. Um, we've heard stories about John's son who, you know, wasn't a particularly strong boss, kind of an inept guy. What do you look at John's legacy as, the, the Gotti legacy? Because we know it's, you know, the layperson believes that the Gotti name is very big and whatnot. But what do you look at their legacy as? Because, you know, you got to wonder. Uh, there, there was a lot of stuff jumbled towards the end. Well, I, I mean, his legacy is that, uh, you know, what his mouth and – what he, the way he acted, addressed, and the attention he brought. I won't use my mouth. I'll use the government, George Gabriel, and powerhouses. When I, after I cooperated, I said, you know, John helped us out so much. I said, what? He cooperated? No, no, no. But he brought so much heat on the mob. He wrecked the fucking mob. We got Congress people, everybody though. What his actions went against, you wrecked the entire mafia. And I get that. That's part of his legacy. That all that fancy Dan bullshit, walking around with fucking $3,000 brownie suits, $200 fucking tie, five carat diamond pick you. Yeah, I got a little pebble on my fucking finger, but that fucking five carat. Yeah. You know, all of that bullshit took the fucking mob down. Let's go back to their original tapes about where the war started, why Castellano, that, those tapes alone, they used everything they said against the commission case. The bosses, all the bosses, everybody went away on his tapes. Mm -hmm. They didn't, after those tapes and we took over, we're talking about a whole new set of tapes that we went to prison on. Right. So his actions, all that flamboyant and stuff, and oh, John was the real deal. No, the real deal, it was a secret society. Period. You don't flaunt it. You don't talk about it. You don't admit it. Well, he admitted it was a gangster. Yeah, that's not goes in Austria. And that took down. That's his real legacy. He was not a rat. But he, what his actions did, and remember Frankie the Chico's conversation with me. If he acts the fool, if Frankie lived more than that four months, he would have killed John in a minute. Right. That was Frankie and Chico. Now I'm going to say one more thing about Frankie and Chico. That John had a good, good, strong crew. So I'll tell all these people, all these bullshitters. He had a strong crew. Me, I had a powerful crew. Put my crew and John's crew together, and we weren't a pimple on Frankie and Chico's ass. That's how powerful he was. So that he was the real deal. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm not trying to say I was the real deal. He was the real deal. I think I was the real deal as well. I loved Goes in Austria. I did insane shit for Goes in Austria. Um, and I, I still love it. Till yeah. today. It's part of me. But I uh, changed my life. I won't kill. I won't go back to prison. I'm done. 22 years. I had enough. I'm going to make some money. When you come down and see me, you're going to bring me some fucking money so I could. Uh... <laughs> it would be but, an honor to kick up to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, right. Listen, I'm, I, I want to talk. I'm going to get you a, a great coffee and a little tequila. We'll, we'll kill it. I, I love it. I'm, we'll come down. We'll see you. We'll have a good time. I want to ask you one question before we let you go, because I want to ask you about being the Don of social media. I, I've heard you're the, you're the new Don of social media. You're killing it. 
who would have thought a guy in his late seventies is is killing it the way you are on on, on the social media? But I want to ask you quickly about Junior. Uh, do you consider what he did a rap move to sit down with the government? What would his father say about that? You think? You heard about that, right? Two thousand five. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't want to. I see. I'm not a type of guy. I don't want to call him a rap. Yeah. Junior is. I, 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 and I know him well. He he didn't belong in the life. Yeah. Really. He went to military school. John brought people in the life who didn't belong in the life. And the kid didn't belong in the life in the first place. He shouldn't have been in there. He's not a bad kid. He's not a stupid kid. Um, he's, he seems like a good family man. He's got a bunch of kids. Yeah. You know, I, I don't get along with him, obviously. I cooperate, so he probably don't like me. But, uh, uh, but he didn't belong in the life. And I think he said that himself. Yes. Um, it's it's really, it's a shame that he was born. And then, I mean, John tried to put a whole bunch of people around him. And he, he made the kid, when he went to make him, I said, John, he's going to military school. Maybe he'll go to West Point. And maybe he'll become a, a general in the, you know, why do you want to bring him in his life? Right. You know, but he insisted upon him. I actually made John Jr. I yes. was the head of the ceremony. Yeah. And I made him a captain because the, the father, it's nepotism, shouldn't be doing it. So he put me in charge. I made him and I made him a captain. And he's not a bad kid. I mean, but uh, he didn't belong in, 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 the, in the mafia. And then he put his other brothers, Pete. I call him Igor. His fucking eye was hanging out. Ugly motherfucker. It was like Igor. He's the one who put the hit on me. This fucking yeah. guy couldn't. He, oh my god, he couldn't put a fucking hit on the dog. <laughs> he put a hit on me. I I, I scared the hit guys away. And yeah. you said that some of my own people. Yeah, one one. Huh. Now let's go to the other side of that. Tato's son Charlie Boy was a hunter, and he couldn't hit a fucking bullseye three hundred yards. They were afraid to come near me, so they grabbed him, Pete Gotti, and said. Use your talents, go down there with the uh, hook. And this other guy, Fat Sally, I didn't know him from a hole in the wall. None of my crew went except for Huck. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, Huck wanted to be a captain, right? That's why he did it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he was a fucking other fat ass, you know. But but anyway, I mean, a punk bitch, still another one. And I made him a tough guy. But so, what was I saying? Peter Gotti calls Charlie in. Now, boss, is, he became the boss. I don't know how the fuck they made him the boss, but he was the boss. He couldn't even see the fucking wall, let alone be the boss. But anyway, he, he tells Charlie to go down and take care of me. Charlie said, go and fuck yourself. I love the guy. I'm not doing it. Everybody didn't do it. Just hug. So when you say my crew, no. One well, guy. Yeah, one guy. No, I just want to clear it up. Yeah, so absolutely. The audience don't think my whole crew went against me. I got people talking to me now, and I don't mean gangsters. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But mm -hmm. ex-gangsters, uh, gangsters, women, who I know for 40, 50, 60 fucking years. How bad of a guy could I have been? Right. But they're sending me letters and notices and whatever, and we love you, but we always did. We understand. See, they understand now. History, that's what history does. It brings out the truth. Sure. Definitely you know, does. So in the beginning, you know, you could say a lot of things. You could say whatever you want to say. And uh, so, but one guy, one guy. Huh. And, one, uh, uh, and, and I'm glad you kind of elaborated on that. You mentioned, I mentioned John Jr. You know, I know you sat down with uh, Jimmy Calandra recently, a couple other people. Um, you're mm -hmm. obviously killing it on social media. Th there is someone that's popped up recently, and I, I noticed you don't talk about him. You, you see, Mikey Scars is around. Is that why is that? You 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 made him as well, right? He was there that night. Do you do you ever yes, foresee? He, he was there the same time. I think John Junior was there. Do you ever foresee you know doing anything with him? You were in the, you know same family. You know he obviously he was around. You know his f father was in that life. Do, do you foresee any working with him at any point or anything? I doubt it. I doubt it. He's doing his own little thing. And uh, 
whatever. I, I, I saw one or two things he's doing. Yeah. Right now, right now, I'm I'm excelled to the point. Uh, now my my YouTube dropped down a little bit uh, because I haven't been doing things. Yeah, I signed a few fucking really heavyweight contracts that pull my attention away. I've heard that. I signed a thing that I'm going to do about a, a notorious hit. I can't say it because I'm on the contract. The only reason, but a movie. They they're working on a movie right now. I have people writing it, script writers and stuff. They also, in that contract, they're going to do the story of my life. Something similar to The Sopranos, but a lot more truth to it. But I love The Sopranos. It was great movie. It was based on a true story. Mine is going to be more of a true story. because They, they have a lot of the facts. So I'm working on that. A documentary, a Broadway play, uh, a few things I'm working on that's really taking up a lot of my time. Yeah. And now I've been beefing up my my team. I got some really great people. I'm doing uh, <coughs> this girl, Anna. She's my, the head of my uh, uh, the, the teams. And I got another one, Melissa, I'm working with. She's, she's the, head, the director of operations and is the, the, the manager of... Uh, the office, she's the office manager, and uh, and I'm working with them. Really smart, really good people. Matter of fact, Anna, Anna is also doing. I'm doing the the bull, the bullpen, yep. and the bullpen. I was doing it, and I got caught up with this fentanyl that's coming in, and it just bugging the shit out of me. So I've been doing research, and I've been fighting it, and I've been calling people in and people are sending me videos now. So that caught my attention a lot. Yeah. I can't understand this. I mean, we would, I get information that from November, I think it was 21 to November of 22, whatever it is, or the year before, whatever year, 110,000 people OD mm -hmm. or died. Yeah. Right? yeah, died. So, and now I read an article with ABC that's saying, Every three people, every hour That's in crazy. Manhattan, New York, are uh, ODing. Some of them die, some of them don't. But every hour, three people. Yeah. Now, my argument to this is that politicians, I'm not going to say which party, I mean, politicians notice. It's factual. Mm -hmm. How could they not close the border? How could they not stop this? Well, I, you know... On another show, let me just say this. Yeah. If we have a ship in the, in the ocean with 200 sailors on the, on the ship, somebody shoots a missile and takes it down. All 200 sailors are dead. We're going to war like this. Right away. No questions about it, right? Mm-mm. 99%. And 110,000 people. This stuff is coming out of India and China, going into... Mexico into some cartels and coming yeah. across the borders wide open, they're allowing them to come in. Yeah, absolutely. So, how and I'm telling the public, join me on Sammy the Bull on my website to fight this and to fight the politicians who don't say anything. Let's vote them out. Well, this affects us all. I mean, we all are affected by, I mean, I, I know when I walk out of here in 20 minutes, I mean, you'll see people on the street, they got needles in their arms and, and, you know, we've all been affected. Everyone in our family, people have family members. Listen, we had a cartel, we had a DA, a guy on last week. I mean, he spent 20 years fighting Los Etas and some of these drug cartels. I think in the end, Sammy, the, the difference between the sailors and, and, and us, uh, as far as the, the drug epidemic, uh, the drug epidemic is big business. There's a lot of money in it for this country and they know it. Why would they shut it down? But I, I think it's a great cause. I think what your social media team does. I, I wanted to say to you, your, your people are terrific. I mean, they're very kind with, with helping me out, setting this up. Um, what do you think of this new name for you, by the way? Donna Social Media. That's a great name. Yeah, you know, it, it came up and I was explaining. I'm going to explain it for your audience to understand what a Don is. <laughs> and, you know, you, people say Godfather. And I'm going to give them the difference. There's a boss of a family. He's the boss and the father of the family. And he's called Godfather. 
He's the godfather. And he's a boss of his family. Adon is like Carlo Gambino, a boss of bosses. All the bosses come to him, not to ask permission, but for advice or ask him permission, certain things. He's the Don. A Don is a whole nother title. So somebody started calling me the Don of not of the social media, but of the social media of all these gangsters or whoever they are talking about the mafia. So somebody had related to me as being the Don of social media or not all of social media, but at least the mafia parts of it. And then somebody had said, call me a Don. It was two or three people from different countries who texted stuff in. They're very knowledgeable of the mafia. And they say, Sammy, when you talk, we've listened to many, many people talk. I'm not going to mention names, but a lot of people talking on the shows and whatever. And for sure, after listening to you for a year, you're the Don of the mafia. You should have been. And you are now. Because there's no other stories. And I'm not telling there's a lot of people, you know, doing stories and making a living. I'm not telling people don't watch them. You can watch them. But I am bent on being truthful, honest. I don't hide from what I did. I don't lie about it. You know, a lot of guys tell me, uh, you know, well, you, I found God. They'll ask me, did you find God? It'd be easy to say, yeah, I, and I changed my life. No, nah, no. He wasn't in any of the prisons I was in. I didn't see him. I didn't bunk into him. I I believe in God, but I'm not going to say I found him in prison. That's why I changed my life. I walked away from the life I told already told my story. Why? It had nothing to do with God. It had to do with John Gotti and me. So I don't want to go into areas that, like, you know, why am I doing this? Got people, I did stories about the fentanyl, and some people texted me back. What's in your business? What's in my business? There's people dying like flies all over the place. Yeah. There's families. I have thousands of people texting me messages. I hear this from people sending me a woman, a, a kid. I hear these stories. I just, before this happened this morning, I got a tape from a guy who heard me talk and said, Sammy, I'm here. I want to join you. I've been a drug addict. I've been this all my life. I cured, I, I've been straight, I got married, I got a couple of kids. I love your story, I want to be able to help people and I want to join you in your fight. It's my fight. And then I tell people, why would you want to shut me down? I got no gain in this thing uh -huh. yeah, to fight. I probably got everything to lose. Right. Somebody yeah. want to shut me down or do some bullshit. I, but I, I can't tell people, why don't you do something to try to stop it, use your voice, and I'm going to sit down scared that I'm going to that I'm I'm worried about. Fuck it, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I can't tell them I'd be a real hypocrite, so I I just open my mouth too, and I tell the truth about it. The politicians, the news media, fucking. I mean, I know a lot of people in the media. There's a woman I asked her once. How come you don't say something? You went to college. You're a real good person. I know you. You're a good person. Why don't you tell the truth? Sammy, I'm a single mom, and I lose my job in fucking five minutes. Right. It kills me. You're right. I said, all right, all right. Don't get excited. I'm not yelling. I mean, and you're right. You're a single mom. You got to do what you got to do. Sometimes you got to shut your mouth. But I'm glad you said that. So you choke on it. Yeah. So, I mean, this is the world we're living in now. Good people are afraid to talk. And I don't want to, she's a single mom. I don't want to put her in trouble, or I definitely would never say her name. But, you know, this is the country we're living in now. And I don't know what's going to happen to it. I mean, the border, I'm going to do something about the border real shortly. And because it has to do not so much with the border, but it has to do with the drugs. Yeah. I heard a story the other day. I heard it. I don't know if it's true. It's not true. The Border Patrol stops this car. And there's a guy driving the car. And uh, a lady has got a, a baby in her arm. 
wrapped up and shrink it out of a bottle, bottles in the mouth. And they say, okay, where are you going to go? The cement, they're ready to let them go. But the dog starts growling. And he's jumping up. Smell something. So now they're stopping him. What is it? The dog goes right to the baby. What is it? The baby is dead. They cut the baby open, took Jeez. all the guts out, and put pills in the whole baby's body. Ruthless. Now, that's, that, that, is, that is beyond my imagination. Yeah. Now, I read that, and I've heard it. I don't really talk about it, but, but if it's true, and I don't want to say it's true because I, well, I don't. That's a Sammy. If it's true, that's, I mean, I, how could you shut up? How could you not talk about this? Those folks, those people down there are an incredibly depraved group. I mean, the cartels that are doing this stuff. I, I think it's a very noble cause, man. I, I I want all of our people, you know, go, you know, nonetheless, go check out SamyTheBull.com. You can learn all about it. I'm good for you for speaking up. You know, I, I tried to on this show. Like I said, we had a D agent on last week. Uh, we try to bring the kind of the stories about what's going on down there uh, uh, in Mexico. And look, you're killing it. You're doing a great job. You know, you have some great stories. I know. A lot of people have seen them, but go check out SamyTheBull.com. Sammy, like I said, hopefully I can come see you sometime. We'll make yeah, that happen. And Definitely. Uh, well, let me add one more thing. Yeah, you're, go ahead. You're doing the same thing, and that's why I'm on your show. Yeah. I know about you fighting this little thing with the drugs. and You, take, you care about people, and yeah. that's why I'm here talking with you, bro. Appreciate that. But you didn't give me no fucking money. I, I will. I, I, I got an envelope <laughs> for you. Don't worry. I got an envelope for you. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, but no, I... <laughs> So I get your stamp of approval, you're saying. I appreciate that. That means a lot. No, no, you, you're doing a great job, too. Listen, anybody who talks about it and is trying to fight for people who can't fight, and you got a voice, you got a following, you got a voice, you're a smart guy, and if you could do that, my hat is off to you, bro. I don't want to take it off because i got no hair. <laughs> oh, I hope so. <laughs> Listen, I hope someday. I, I think it's the biggest uh, – you know, really staying on this country at this point. The drug war is a failure, and I, I it, it's ripped the country apart. And I hope someday in my lifetime, maybe I'll see something different change. But, um, Sammy, good for you for fighting it. Um, you, incredible life story. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk again. Uh, I know a lot of people in my company were blown away that I was speaking to you. Even even people that I never knew thought they knew who you are. I, they knew who you were. You're, you're a big name out there, Sammy. A lot of people know you, so I'm happy to have you. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. My pleasure. It's been my pleasure. It really has. You brought the best out of me, I think. I, I, that means a lot. Thank you so much. You're, you're a great interviewer. Appreciate that. Thank you Love so much. Talk to you soon. Adios. Sounds good.